I don't think there was any way for Andy and I to predict where we were going when we were young. It was something we did because we loved it, truly, making games. I had always thought that Andy and I, as a team, were going to be successful. But, you know, Naughty Dog, who, who would have thought he would create Naughty Dog? Jason and I met when we were 12, and we were sort of video game fans, like, and we were early computer owners. We both had Apple IIs. I had an Apple II Plus. I think he had a new model of Apple II. He had just come out. Andy and I met in Hebrew school, and neither of us was that interested in Hebrew school, and we both had an affinity for computers. I had been trying to write my own video games because, well, that was definitely cheaper than $50. So we had this idea, oh, let's try to make one and sell it. There weren't a lot of books on the subject at the time. There was no internet. Um, so you had to kind of learn on your own. And if you found somebody that you could talk to that might have more answers than you, it was very helpful. Andy had the answers. My games, like, they're programmed pretty well and they're fast and I know assembly language and stuff, but they look really bad. And his games looked really cool, but that kind of crashed and did weird glitches. And I'm like, why don't I program it and you draw it? We just sort of started doing that. It wasn't like, oh, let's found a video game studio. Beats mowing lawns. If you asked our parents today what they thought of what we were doing back then, they would say, oh, we pushed them to make games. We were very supportive. Nobody thought like that back then. Nowadays, it's awesome. You're 15 years old, you've sold an iPhone game. You're a hero, you tell all your friends. Back then, you were a geek. I mean, you were on computers. What, what were you doing? So we spent oh, a year, year and a half, like making this really actually pretty exact copy of Super Punch-Out before actually getting into the question of which Jason's intellectual property lawyer father informed us, well, no, you can't sell that. And so again, we were like, nah, let's do a more regular game. And I had gone on a ski trip and decided to make a, a skiing simulator, which utterly failed to recreate skiing, but was actually a pretty fun game. The goal was to get to the lodge at the bottom and meet up with the babes. I was a very bad programmer, but a decent artist. So I took it to Andy and Andy said, oh, I can make that better. So he made it better. Uh, and we ended up with a game that was actually pretty fun. So we used this graphics toolbox that, it was from this company in Michigan called Baudville, and they had this little license thing where you could license it for like 150 bucks. And they said, you can definitely publish this. You had to get permission from them to publish it using their tool set, but we'd rather publish it for you, and we're national. And we were like, cool, we're 15, that's awesome. And you'll pay us? And they're like, we'll give you $250. We're like, whoa, we made it. So that was actually published in a real box. It was not the most glamorous box or anything, but there was this real excitement, like, Ooh, it's like a professional thing, your name and lights of sort. Ski Craze probably sold a thousand units, but we made a few thousand dollars off of that. And keep in mind, this is, you know, 1985, 1986, and today's dollars is probably two, three thousand dollars. That's a huge amount of money for a 15 year old back then. And we were just, we were rolling in it. I mean, we were pimping. We thought we really should be bigger than this. It was pretty obvious, Electronic Arts, which was sort of new and not public yet and like was very sort of pro game designer. So we called the front desk, literally. Oh, you've made some games? Well, like FedEx is your games. So we FedEx them the games, come back and they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll make a game with you. What do you want to make? And so we started making games for EA. And to make it sound easy, it actually was that easy. We just cold called. How's like $15,000 and 10% and we're like, cool. <laughs> and it progressed and it kept rolling. And the last computer my father ever bought me was the first one he bought me. Everything else was funded by the rolling success of the games as we moved forward. So they sent us a contract and our dads who are actually lawyers like haggled it over a little and we renamed the company from Jam Software, which vaguely stood for Jason Andy's Magic, which is about the worst name you could ever have for a game company. But we stuck with it for a couple of games when we were working with Baudville because that's just what we had come up with. When we started working with Electronic Arts, uh, Trip Hawkins said, you know, we looked and this name is actually taken. So you need a name. And we thought, hmm, 
that's gonna be tough because we don't, we really don't know what we want. And he said, you really have 24 hours because we want to sign this contract. It's hard to remember exactly where the name Naughty Dog came up from. To this day, I don't remember who came up with it or how, but in 24 hours, we became Naughty Dog. So at that time, we were actually a company, but Jason and I went to college and went in different states. So I went to Harvard College in Philadelphia and he went to the University of Michigan. So we were doing this all by the phone, which meant for very large, long distance bills, and that the baud rate of our modem was like, our modems was rather essential. But the distractions of actually going to college were more significant. Assignments, girls, <laughs> parties, and whatnot. Even so, they were like, well, what are you gonna do for your next game? And we had a pitch. Rings of Power was really Andy's baby. This time it was gonna be a PC game. But as we were walking through Electronic Arts one day, Andy looked over and saw a bunch of wires coming out of a weird silver box and he said, hey, that looks like a reverse engineered Sega Genesis. And we were both quickly whisked by security into a room. They're like, you have to sign an NDA, you can't tell anyone that it exists and all this other stuff. And Andy said, you know, we probably should be making Sega Genesis games. And EA, Trip Hawkins, and Ben Gordon said, yes, you should, sign the document, and yes, you should. So we became Genesis developers almost by accident. So Rings of Power sold 100,000 or 95,000 cartridges, and it was probably actually the most complicated and involved role-playing game like ever done on a cartridge machine. EA can only print so many cartridges. So they called us up and they said, we have good news, we have bad news. The good news is you're sold out and everyone loves your game. The bad news is we're not gonna print anymore. We're printing Madden instead. We came out the same month as Madden and they were selling out of Madden completely. So if you can only print so many games a year, you don't say, well, I'll sell this, you know, sell to these people, I'll sell to these people. You say, how can I make the most money? And the way you make the most money is you only print Maddens. And that really killed our buzz. And we decided to stop working on games. Andy went to MIT to study artificial intelligence in the computer science department. And I moved to California to learn how to surf and to get into the special effects business. But somewhere midway in that year, maybe six months later, and this is the beginning of 93. 3DO started up, existed, and Trip Hawkins called us up and said, you guys should be making games. Trip could sell you a, a turd. Trip's a very good salesman. So uh, he was spinning, spinning this thing, it sounded very cool. And he's like, why don't I send you a development machine for like free, just check it out. We said, no, 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 we, we made this Rings of Power game for you guys and you didn't reprint it. And he's like, We've solved that. We're making CD-ROM games. And he knew the hotspot. He's like, he's like, I know you didn't like how it all played out with those cartridges. He's like, but this is on CD. It's 650 megabytes. Huge amounts of data. Endless. 3,000 polygons. 16,000 colors. Ooh. You can make as big a game as you want. Put in digital music. Put in movies. Put in whatever you want. And it does 3D. And we're like, whoa. It's a grand new world. And within a month, we are back into making games. And at that time, the hottest games in the arcade, by far, were the fighting games. You've got this great game, Mortal Kombat, and you've also got Street Fighter. They're doing incredibly well. Now you have a new platform in the 3DO, and neither of those games are coming out for this system. So we'll fill that hole. Amazingly, even though I was still enrolled at MIT, I probably spent about two or three hours a week like actually doing anything related to school. Basically, we worked on Way of the Warrior like nonstop. And he rented an apartment uh, that we both shared. And we basically used the apartment as our studio. We took the money that we had made from Rings of Power and we spent it on Way of the Warrior and we did not go get a publisher. Andy and I had left the Rings of Power uh, debacle with the idea that we had to control our destiny. Way of the Warrior turned out to be a game we could make with our own money, on our own budget, on our own time, without a publisher. So when the first trade show came out, we were the only unsigned project. There are all these publishers and they're like, oh, who's publishing this game? Like, no, no one yet. We're looking for a publisher. And that was a very unusual circumstance for them because they were used to having to put up money for more or less an idea and a team. And instead they got to see what they were getting here. So a bidding war started. Universal thought, we've got to get into games. We should go out. We should acquire some good studios, bring them onto the lot. They had offered this, us this deal that was too good to turn down, which was called a housekeeping deal, which is they're like, move out to California and we'll give you offices on the Universal lot next to Spielberg. And they're free. We'll give you a secretary and like phone and internet and all that. It's all free. 
And I remember when I convinced Andy to leave uh, graduate school, his father said, that's the dumbest thing you're ever going to do. You're leaving MIT, computer science with a master's degree. You could go for your PhD. This is a bad move. And so we moved out to California to work on Universal Studios' back lot uh, and started working on what ended up becoming Crash Bandicoot. I first heard about Night Dog, uh, gosh, it must have been back in 1995. I had just come from a standard game studio. I was actually working in the film industry. I was working at Crystal Dynamics, and I got a call about this place called Naughty Dog. It's a startup, it'll probably fold. At first I thought it was like a porn studio or something. It was just a bunch of guys in a room trying to hammer something out. I started hearing um, rumors about a game called Crash Bandicoot. And we would look at it and just kind of get blown away by what was happening on the screen. They were like, how are they doing that? With Crash Bandicoot, it was only six people, but you could have sworn it was a team that was bigger than that. That legacy has come through all the years. And the passion that we put into making games. In the 18 years that I've been here. After almost close to 20 years for me. I still feel that. I still see that here at Night Dog. I first ran into Andy and Jason about 20 years ago now when they were in the process of packing up everything and taking the big drive from uh, out east to set up shot on the lot and start making games for Universal. Way of the Warrior was our last garage game. It had its problems, but it taught us a lesson. And that lesson is there's a marketplace and the market wanted a fighting game and it wanted it on 3DO. So when the rumored next generation systems came out, we thought, there's probably a hole to fill there too. So it was still early in the days of uh, PlayStation. There's a belief uh, in the console business that you know each platform needs a mascot. And uh, on PlayStation, there's no such you know thing like you know Mario or you know Sonic. We've been playing a lot of Donkey Kong Country, and we always love that type of game. And we're like, well, what if we did one of these in 3D? No one's probably doing that. It seems kind of hard. That was the number one genre, if you looked out there. And they were all in 2D, things like Mario or Sonic. And we had this very large mutual interest in finding out, now that the hardwares could do 3D, what a character action game would become. Mark Cerny was our executive producer at Universal. And he was instrumental in creation of Crash. We got along right away. And he was clearly so smart and so knew everything about the video game business. He was the you know, producer of the title, and he was doing game design and uh, helping, you know, the old, you know, aspects of the development. And of course, behind Mark was uh, Naughty Dog. First big conversation we had was with staffing. Is Andy and Jason were used to doing titles, just the two of them. And we thought about it, and we thought, you know, it'd be really nice to have employees people to work with us, a team. And they thought they'd staff up to five people, but that they'd do two titles. So really the first conversation was, no, let's, let's spend the money, let's focus on one game, let's staff up to huge levels. And we hired our first employees, um, and some of them are still here. The studio culture back when I started was crass. <laughs> But it was a lot of fun. I was about 10 years older than everybody else and the only woman. And they kept saying things like, yes, she's a naughty dog. She's a dog. And I remember, though, it was kind of funny because Jason Rubin um, compared me to Jane Goodall and said that <laughs> I was there just to see the male developers behave. Jason and Andy were both uh, very charismatic guys, very uh, self-assured and very confident. And they were talking a big game. There was an air of confidence that that you could really feel. Like you knew these guys had a vision and they knew how to get there. You know, Andy's the brains and Jason's kind of the passion and those two guys together were, you know, dynamite. They were the visionaries and they definitely conducted the orchestra. It was a very small orchestra. It was like a garage band at the time. And we all sat practically in the same room and communication consisted of, you know, looking over your shoulder at the guy sitting next to you or maybe looking over your shoulder at the guy behind you. Communication just was easy. Historically speaking, the team for Crash Bandicoot was huge. Seven people on one project. Uh, and we spent almost $2 million, if you can imagine that. It was in Hollywood, but when you visit the Hollywood like office, was these you know, indie guys working you know, around the crop. I was used to working with thousands of pixels. And Jason Rubin said, I want you to do a texture for this wall. 
It has to be 32 by 32 pixels. <laughs> I, was, I was like, you want me to do what? <laughs> With what? <laughs> it was unbelievable to me. I mean, of course, we now have projects with 300 people and we spend $100 million. But back in the day, Crash was the high end of what was being spent on video games. From the very beginning, and with no justification, we decided we were gonna take on the best game makers in the business, including Miyamoto himself. And we thought we're gonna make the PlayStation mascot. The 3DO was clearly sort of not winning. There was no competition, actually. It was losing against itself. And you had Sony, who was a new contender, but they seemed to be taking things really seriously. The machine was kind of clean and quite simple, and they didn't have a character mascot. And with no urging or even communication with Sony, we started working on the title that we were convinced was going to become their mascot. Halfway through, we sort of slipped a tape to the head of Sony Computer Entertainment America. From Sony's standpoint, it was this weird thing out of left field that they were asked to look at a title that had over a year of production on it. The game was already past the alpha stage, meaning that the you know, game was pretty playable from beginning to the end. And the Sony Computer Entertainment America saw the potential, huge potential of the title. So they sent somebody down, and there was Crash. And it was amazing and nothing really had that kind of polygon draw level. They thought, this is a hole that we need to fill. We don't have a Mario. And so they kicked out, I forgot what title, but they kicked out another title that they had and put us front and center at the corner of their booth on more monitors than any other game, right across from Mario. And suddenly, we went from working on this game that we thought we'd be the mascot, to oh my god, Sony is actually putting us up against Mario. Crash ended up being the centerpiece for this very scrappy marketing campaign that Sony did. I mean, the guy in a suit. And it's not Crash Bandicoot, it's a guy wearing a Crash Bandicoot suit out in front of the real Nintendo headquarters taunting them. Even though Crash was never actually a mascot, he represented the system. One in 20 PlayStation titles that was sold was a Crash Bandicoot title. We thought Crash would do pretty well. We didn't anticipate it being the number one brand for PlayStation. It just kept on selling and kept on selling. It didn't slow. In fact, it gained. Crash was huge. Crash, of all the characters that we created, Crash was the biggest. The success of Crash Bandicoot was something we both planned for and hoped for, but never perhaps really expected would actually happen as big as it did, even though it went exactly according to plan. And we were doing press, and we were having interviews, and things that had never happened in the past with any of our other games. But we were already behind schedule for Crash 2. And then we were behind schedule for Crash 3. We went from one crunch to another which was the, the flip side of success. But now, uh, money was really starting to come in, and so Naughty Dog went through explosive growth. The studio vibe at that time was very small because there were, I think I was like the 26th person there. I was like hired as a temp to um, kind of like help out and stuff as the company kind of got bigger and I kind of did everything that nobody had time for a little bit or whatever. So 14 and a half years later. <laughs> we were growing very quickly as the industry was. With the PlayStation 1, certainly you wanted to do the games on low budget, and you could because they were, they were relatively small games compared to what was being done today. On the PlayStation 2 at the beginning, publishers were saying, these games are really expensive. That ended up killing them. Other publishers like EA and Activision, Sony, Microsoft, said, make the biggest splash that you can. And Naughty Dog went from being a team that always tried to save money and work as tightly as we could to hire big, think big. Let's put everything we have into making these games. There was a technological leap. You could do a lot more in PS2 than it was in PS1. It let us really expand our design goals. We don't have any warp rooms or any of the things that you know we had. We wanted to stop building levels and build worlds. And so for Jack and Daxter, we wanted to take on that challenge. No load screens in the entire game. One massive, uh, perfectly connected world. The Jack pitch was incredible. And you saw like just this depth of vegetation and all this life and you're blown away because you've never seen anything like that before. And it was so powerful and moving and it's about 15 minutes of just like, this is gonna be the 
biggest game ever. And the art was phenomenal. I mean, it was just so bright and colorful, and that really kind of hooked me, and I thought, God, this will make a terrific game. From my understanding, there was maybe the option with Jason and Andy getting the contract to continue doing Crash games with Universal and Sony, but the team, we all kind of voted, like, let's move on, let's, let's do something else. We felt a little hamstrung by, by that situation, and additionally, when the PS2 came out, we thought, It'd be nice to be able to reinvent the character and start over. To most of us, it was a breath of fresh air. Some of us were kind of scared because it, it's a new IP and, and we've always uh, sort of gotten spoiled with the success of Crash, that it became like our comfort blanket. I have to say there was a lot of tension as we were getting ready to announce Jack and Daxter. Would this be received as well as Crash? Our expectation was extremely high <laughs> because of, of course, the success of uh, uh, Crash Bandicoot. The initial couple of months, you know, before and after the launch of Jack and Daxter was uh, uh, very, very uh, stressful. I remember Jason at our announce event um, getting extremely ill 90 minutes before the event going on stage, nailing it, and then after the event, within 90 minutes, being perfectly healthy again. I and mean, that's, that's the degree of nerves we had as we were going out and telling the world about it. We were a little bit nervous because it was, because everybody had loved Crash so much and we kind of missed him. But um, as Jack and Daxter evolved, we started to feel better about the project. We were sort of trying to do the same thing because if you'd noticed, Jack 1 is a little bit for the younger age but it was, we were adding more story to it. We were taking our narrative more seriously and our characters are more developed. The fidelity of the animation took way more animation time. And then we had cutscenes that were way more elaborate with like synced up with dialogue and it just got too hard. Walk it off, tough guy! Everything was a little bit more complex and you had to become more specialized. They had characters that were talking and nobody to manage anything. So that's kind of how I started doing the localization on that game. We had somebody who was doing nothing but lighting our levels, and we had people who were doing nothing but animating our characters. It was the first time in Naughty Dog history that we tried this. It used to not be that way. You used to just do it. And now do I have to go through this other person to do it? I'm not quite sure. It was a difficult shift for us mentally to, to get our, our heads around. We were 80 some odd people working on games, and I was trying to speak to every artist at least once a week, Andy was trying to talk to everyone on the engineering side, and it was getting untenable. They actually would pass around an old, like, leather dog collar of Morgan's, and when you had that dog collar, you could say anything you wanted. It was kind of, you know, kind of interesting, kind of nice. Once you get to about 50, you kind of stop doing that a little bit. Everybody went out to lunch together. You know, everybody would get up and say, okay, where are we going today? And as the company got bigger, it got more and more difficult to do that. It was now getting too large of a team for just Jason or just Andy to be able to go out and like sort of speak the gospel of like what the, the direction was. I hadn't had a vacation in a long time. The team got a month off at the end of every project. Projects were going from one year to two years, so that was less often. And that month for me, getting ready for the next project and going on some sort of press tour. So I looked at it and I thought, you know, I, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do this without breaking down. When we found out Jason and Andy were going to leave, uh, it was it was scary. We were going to become a wholly owned subsidiary of Sony, and we kind of liked the culture that we had at Naughty Dog, and were afraid probably that that was going to change more than anything else. Some people were afraid that there would it would become sort of a more corporate culture. Do we sooner or later get folded into Sony? Will they allow us to continue to keep the culture that we have? Would they want to instate producers? You have to realize back then the only people that really made the decision was Jason and Andy. We all knew that those guys were sort of at the helm. They were out, out in the front and as loud as Jason can yell, he's going like, go faster and further and better. And you kind of knew or had some sense of confidence that he's out there doing that. If this is Jason's leaving next month, it's chaos. And a lot of teams fall apart with that. If this is Jason and Andy are leaving next month and there's no preparation, whoa boy. So I went to, to Shuhei Yoshida, who was, who was my boss at the time at Sony, and I said, I believe that Evan Wells can run this company. They started grooming myself and Stephen White, who is the, the lead programmer at the time, to sort of carry on the torch. I didn't try to change what was working really well. So I maintained an uh, external producer in the US even to continue to work with Naughty Dog, as if Naughty Dog was 
independent. And actually, that has, structure hasn't changed even now. And that transition is why Naughty Dog was one of the most successful transitions of executives leaving in the history of the game industry. I uh, was super fortunate that Jason and Andy uh, gave uh, me the opportunity to, to pick up the, the reins. This has been the chance of a lifetime, and I just come to work every day and hope I don't screw it up. What I'm most proud of is not the fact that we created Crash Bandicoot, but that we were able to create multiple Crash Bandicoots and then follow that up with Jack and Daxter. It was a massive undertaking and really good games. Really, really good games. And every now and then I get in a conversation with someone, well, what do you do? Well, you know, I used to, and I made Naughty Dog, and you know, we made Crash Bandicoot. They say, oh, Naughty Dog. Yeah, Last of Us. Wow. So, I mean, really, if we look at the history of, of Naughty Dog, I think we're seeing a time when Andy and Jason were running the company, and Jason was the very strong personality that anchored it. And uh, then the last 12 or so years where Evan Wells and Christoph Balestra have been anchoring it. And very different approaches, um, very different products. My journey from, from France and the first time I heard about Naughty Dog was just when I was playing Jack and Daxter. And I was like, just, I want to work with those guys. Christoph grew up in the mod scene um, and, and he was self-taught. It, it's, it's awesome, right? Like Christoph worked really hard. He had the respect of everybody around him. People knew automatically who he was going to be. I started here we working on Jack 2 just as a, a gameplay programmer. My English was just absolutely awful. A couple of days in, just like uh, Stephen White, who was the program director, just uh, introduced me to Evan Wells. And he said, hey, you're going to have to work with that guy. Evan started talking to me. I just. I didn't get anything of what he said to me. I'm like, okay, that's gonna be fun. And next thing you know, it's Christoph walking around with the clipboard going, we gotta get this code done. We, you know, we got deadlines, you've got too many open bugs, you gotta fix this stuff. Evan told me, pulled me aside one day at lunch and said, oh, by the way, I just promoted Christoph to vice president. And I'm like, well, that's pretty awesome. I got like a couple of promotions before I took the uh, co-presidency with Evan. I didn't feel like it was just like, uh, oh my God, I have that huge responsibility now. It was more like, okay, cool, all right, let's do it. Jason and Andy sold Naughty Dog to, to Sony, so we were sort of dealing with making sure that we kept intact all of the flexibility that we're accustomed to working with and that we weren't you know, changing our, our company culture. Let's just focus on what we know and just what we love to do and just let's, just, let's be driven by that. It's not like we had a master plan about how to execute uh, for the next 10 years. We were looking at uh, games that, uh, that we were playing as well, that we were enjoying ourselves. Grand Theft Auto set the bar. And it ushered in the era of the, the mature gamer. As the genres of games were getting like, more serious in open world, I think with Jack and Daxter, that story, we tried to like mimic that a little bit, but in our fun, cute, like, Jack and Daxter kind of way. We were doing our best to keep Jack aging up and maturing um, with that audience. But, you know, I think we were kind of hamstrung with uh, the direction we picked at the beginning. It was a realization, I guess, that the, the demographics we were running after was also getting older. And you can see Jack getting closer and closer to human proportions and his weaponry going from kicks and punches and the like, shooting eco. Uh, to machine guns and pistols. I thought, okay, well, you know, shooting's pretty fun, so we should throw us shooting in there too. So we were starting to, I think, just uh, glom onto a lot of ideas that were out there at the time. I hated that. I hated all of that stuff. Uh, I remember some very heated arguments in the studio about the kitchen sink. What was hot on the market at the time and the conversations were sort of like, let's add a hoverboard, let's, let's add a mech. The best decision I think we made for Jack 2, though, is we gave him a voice. You talking to me? Yeah, you talking to... We were convinced that giving the protagonist a voice would somehow prevent you from immersing yourself in the, the role of the hero. And then once you saw sort of like a heavily story driven and a fleshed out world that had all these other characters, you wanted your protagonist to speak. And you can tell Daxter to shut up every now and because Jesus, Daxter. We knew we wanted to actually continue that arc and, and get into realistic storytelling with real human beings in real world settings. That really kind of was where everything was going. People were sort of getting out of the cartoony kind of stuff because now, you know, you could do more 
with the game engines, um, it's like, why not try it? By the time we got to the last Jack game, and we did the racing game, it felt like Jack had kind of run its course and we were ready for something different. What became Uncharted was a horrifying experience. What was hard about making Uncharted? Like everything. We knew that everybody was going to get a leg up in the graphics department. That wasn't going to automatically help people animate their characters better. And so we knew that we were going to have to have the most sophisticated animation system that's ever been written. We had no idea how we could achieve uh, just any of what, what we wanted to do. It just it was like extremely, extremely difficult. Our eyes were so big and our stomach was so not right ready for what was the reality of the PlayStation 3. It had taken maybe six months to get up to speed on PlayStation 2, but with PlayStation 3, we'd spent over a year trying to learn the new graphics technologies and trying to learn how to use the SPUs for world simulation. And we still weren't at the point where we had a particularly playable game. Naughty Dog was not alone <laughs> to uh, have struggled uh, to make the first title on PS3. But uh, again, especially after the success of Crash Bandicoot and uh, Jack and Daxter, uh, we had really, really high you know, expectation. And ultimately, um, we decided to, you know what, we need to, let's do less high concept and just ground this guy. We wanted to have to render just ordinary clothes. We wanted to like, you know, strip down our hero to be just, um, you know, a dude wearing jeans. And he's going to have to carry the role of protagonist without this, you know, stylistic silhouette or something. He was going to have to be a movie star. All the games we were looking at, best in class at the time, were were uh, Space Marines or badass dudes with like big ass guns that you shouldn't be able to pick up. But we said, you know what? We're going to make a more cinematic approach, and it was really hard. The team that we built was a crash team, and then suddenly you, you give us this curveball where we have to design this realistic, you know, grounded game. It was almost like a revolution that happened inside the animation department when we started talking about using mocap. Mocap was like a big controversy at Naughty Dog. I mean, we did a lot of tests early on, and the hand animated stuff just had. It just wasn't grounded enough. It didn't have that sense of weight. And I think there was only one piece of software at the time that was actually specialized in mocap animation. And so we had to hire somebody just to work on that software to try to translate how the hell to use that data because we didn't know. The technology wasn't working out for us and we wasted probably six or nine months on um, a, a path where we basically had thrown all of our tools out and rewritten everything. At the time, it's like, yeah, throw everything out. We'll, like, we're awesome, we'll remake everything. And looking back, it's like that was the worst idea ever. Nobody could work. I mean, the artists couldn't work, the designers couldn't work, and I had somebody come in my office quitting like every single week. We'd always grown. And it was the first time at Naughty Dog that we actually saw that attrition, that sense of people were actually leaving. We were losing more people than we were hiring. And it was actually hard to hire people. No one actually wanted to join us. And there was a sense that Naughty Dog was a sinking ship. We uh, were struggling to make sure that we, you know, kept everything on the on the rails. It was dark. I, I thought that, you know, this could be the end of Naughty Dog. Um, uh, but we uh, refocused on the entire studio on just getting the PlayStation 3 engine um, and tools back on track. We just wanted to prove to those people that left that we can do this. This is how it gets done, and it's dirty and it's sloppy, and you just. This is part of the process. You know, at the end of the day, like, we needed to put a game out and focusing again, like, on what, you know, what we're doing here, we're making games. It, it was tough, but but little by little, it, it won the team. We soldiered through it. We actually had to scrap. Um, at the time, we'd also started up a PSP game. We're going to do Jack and Daxter on the PSP. So a lot of people on that project were kind of bummed, but I was actually excited because, like, I went from, like, being a designer on this PSP title, like, oh my god, now I'm designing and co-writing this future Naughty Dog PS3 title hasn't been announced yet. I loved it. I thought it was such an amazing opportunity. 
It's funny because in the development process, there's always this moment where just about everybody doubts what they're doing. And there's all these questions. And it, it stays for months. And you have to fight through that. It takes great leadership. It takes people like Evan and Kristoff. And once you get to that first, that first milestone, where you have that first vertical slice where everything is coming together and people can truly see what's going on, the whole morale of the studio changes and everybody gets it. But you have to fight to that point where people get it. Man, it wasn't until the final hour. It wasn't until literally you could sit down and play the game from front to back, start to finish. It was a, such a refreshing moment to sit there and play the game and actually feel like we did it. And I were able to ship Uncharted 1 and, and uh, keep the doors open. <laughs> Even though Uncharted 1 was, was well received, it was kind of seen as a, a lot of people called it a sleeper hit. I remember sitting at the Dice Awards and Uncharted 1 was up for six awards. And I remember sitting next to Evan and Kristoff and we kind of laughed at the concept that we're not gonna win anything, ha ha ha. But every single time an award came up, like, and the nominees are, and it would mention Uncharted, a little glimmer of hope popped in my heart and goes like, maybe we'll win this one. And then constantly, like six times, every single one shot down, didn't win anything. And I remember at the end of that night, I wanted to prove that um, all the people here at Naughty Dog were the best and the tops at what they did. Usually, when you finish a game, the only thing people want to do is just go on vacation. And uh, it was just so different this time around, like, because we knew the potential, we knew tech-wise uh, we could do so much more. So the very first thing that we wanted to do is have this epic train battle where you're like barreling through the mountains, the Himalayan mountains on the top of a train, and climbing inside and outside the train. And we would kind of smirk and go like, that would be cool. The train was the bane of my existence throughout the entire project. I was working on the train. I was working on the train with um, one of the designers and uh, the, it, the back and forth with that train between the programmers, me and the designer, it was, we didn't think we were ever going to get this train to work. That was sort of the, the initial goal that we set for ourselves and it took the entire two years long process before it was fully realized and um, we could actually play it um, in the last weeks before we shipped. Everything at that time, you had those big action set pieces that you just watched. For me, it was a revolutionary concept that you could be playing in that sequence where the, the, the helicopter is shooting at the building and the building's collapsing and I could still be moving the, you know, the main hero around. I still remember when uh, I first saw the demo, uh, E3 demo of Uncharted 2. Today, you'll see what is not only one of the best technical showcases on any platform, but an active cinematic experience like no other game out there. There was that moment when we showed the Warzone demo and the building falling around Nathan Drake. And, and you know, by the end of it, when the hotel's collapsing, Nate barely jumps out and it was all kind of controllable and people were just going crazy. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I couldn't believe what I was uh, watching. And he does this little quip and everybody laughed. There was this, this release of tension. We were, we were almost in that. <laughs> That moment and the code we had behind closed doors was the moment where everything changed for the studio. Uh, we're like, oh my God, that was awesome. People are gonna love this. Now we have to make the rest of the game like this. That demo changed the course of everything and you could feel the momentum shift. We knew like if we just deliver on this promise, we're gonna have something really unique. And then the success was just um, even bigger than what we anticipated. People responded to it in a way that none of us could have imagined. Even though we had worked really hard on it and we loved it, we were amazed at the response we were getting. We would just sit there and be in awe when you, when you looked through all the, uh, the game sites and it was just like, oh my God, we actually made this game. We had like all those awards, it was crazy. I was like, that's never gonna happen again. It's impossible, there's just no way. I mean like, what we did, I don't even, I was like, not even another team, I think, in, in this industry could do it because it was just so crazy. Uh, I guess I was wrong. Over the course of Uncharted 2, um, we, we did really develop um, a, a lot of really great leaders and we wanted to make sure that we were giving the team an opportunity to 
grow and spread their wings and, and, and not sort of just get um, in a, a cycle of just churning out sequel after sequel. They asked me and Bruce Straley, who was game director on Uncharted 2, to head up a new project while the rest of the team went forward with uh, Uncharted 3. Coming off of the success of Uncharted 2, it was a little bit nerve-wracking. You're like, how do we top that? You wonder, you really do wonder how you're going to do it. Uncharted 3 uh, had a really high bar. We had to keep telling ourselves we have to keep the level high. There was pressure on all of the people involved, right? It was pressure on the story, it was pressure on the acting. We had to out-spectacle ourselves. Uncharted 2 was more like a, wow, that's awesome kind of hit, <laughs> you know? Um, and in Uncharted 3, it just, the story became more personal. You got to see more of Nate's background and how he was as a child and how he started. So it, it be, made the audience really become more involved. The team introduced many new aspects and improved upon in what was achieved with uh, Uncharted 2 and didn't disappoint. Coming from Uncharted 3, where you've already thought you've squeezed every performance from the PlayStation 3 and you're asked to, to do much better. The Last of Us was uh, a very, very hard title to do. And we spent months talking about different kinds of games, multiplayer versus single player, minimal narrative versus heavy narrative. And by the end, we kind of like settled uh, we, this one sequence in Uncharted 2 where you get teamed up with Tenzin, this uh, Sherpa that rescues you, and how much we were able to create a bond between these two characters through gameplay. Now we kind of asked ourselves like, well, what if we made a whole game about building a bond between two characters? So we knew from making Uncharted that we had a good idea of how to develop characters and how to parallel core mechanics in with character development. How can we take those same concepts and apply them somewhere else? You would think after doing Uncharted, which is a very grounded game, we'd be doing Space Marines and Final Fantasy something, but we even went more restricted and we more grounded. But we did know that there were some inherent risks there. Um, Night Dog had never made a, a mature rated title. And there, a lot of people were like, wow, this is, this is very brave and it's very scary at the same time. This was going to be a much more subtle and, and nuanced experience and that it was going to have to have its peak excitement moments come through something other than over-the-top spectacle. I think people looked at the train sequence or the collapsing building sequence and they're like, oh, those sequences work because you still had control and there's so much like bomb baths and all this stuff. But I think the key that very few people have picked up on is that it's coupled with story. We know that we can make a building collapse and we can have a rock slip out from Nate's hands and he can catch himself and that's gonna be kind of an exciting moment. But this is a different world and a different rhythm as far as the pacing and, and what we're trying to tell with the characters. Was this gonna be fun not having a jump button? Was it gonna be fun not being able to have all of those big over the top kind of moments? In the beginning, like any IP, the feeling was more negative than positive. I wasn't quite into it in the very beginning, but as you're going along and you're starting to see more and more of the game and you're starting to see more and more of the story, you're like, oh, okay, this is this is good. <laughs> I was hearing things from this, you know, from Sony like, you know, it's late in the console cycle for the PS3. Nobody introduces a brand new IP year five in the in the life cycle of the product. The uh, initial forecast for sales were extremely low. Nobody really believed in the product. Playtests weren't going so well. We got some feedback here and there that maybe there's like little moments that we could hang on to that was just like, okay, like thank God somebody said something positive. But in general, like people weren't responding too well to it. Multiplayer, you know, was revamped almost completely eight weeks before launch. Ellie's collision, being able to be seen by enemies, that was going and coming and going and coming. And we had one build with it in, one build with it out, one build with it in, because we couldn't figure out what was the best way to go. And then finally, in the last like month and a half, we had a couple of play tests where we would see people arguing about different aspects of the story or different moments in the story that affected them and which one was more powerful for them. And everybody had their sort of own play style and their own sort of interpretation of how things worked out. We had people calling days afterwards and they would say, I can't get Ellie out of my head. You know, three, four days later, they're like, you gotta tell me what I miss, what else happens, like what happens to her? And this is unheard of, right? We've never had people get so emotionally wrapped up in a story before. And that was um, 
oh, so refreshing. I don't think anybody could have anticipated the reception that The Last of Us got. You know, we're sitting there on Metacritic and, and refreshing all day long on the day the embargo lifts. I mean, I was sort of in shock and I'm thinking, wow, this is so great. I wasn't expecting the commercial uh, potential of The Last of Us to be this, you know, big. So, you know, another cap off to <laughs> Nordido you know, team. You know, it's amazing uh, talent and uh, passion to make that game. It was just very uh, rewarding that we had been sort of the, the decisions that we had made to, to go in those, those directions were justified and that uh, our audience has matured to the point where they can really appreciate a story like that. And that's the greatest thing about Naughty Dog is like until the final hour and sometimes to our detriment, but until the final hour and then somebody rips the disc out of our hands and say, okay, you're done, we're willing to like change it and edit it and figure it out and, and up to the final hour, just say like, how can we make this thing better? The fact that this, this company has been uh, very much uh, allowed to fail on their own terms allows them to succeed like no other. If you're not failing enough, that means you're not pushing hard enough and you're not trying new things and risking uh, new ideas. It was extremely important for Evan and I just to make sure uh, Bruce and Neil would be, would love like the game they would be working on because uh, you have to be passionate when you just direct the game. You have to 100% believe in it. If we aren't excited about developing it, then surely the gamers aren't gonna be excited to play it. So it's gotta be a labor of love for how hard we work on these games. I mean, it's really amazing how they've managed to balance the, the company goals of creating these massive titles using now hundreds of people. Um, and the individual goals of self-expression in everyday work. We could have made Jack and Dexter, we could have done a spin-off from Uncharted, but instead we were allowed to have this opportunity to explore something we felt really passionate about. One thing we were afraid of just like um, sometimes suffering uh, or working hard, uh, we're just gonna push through it because we know that just, uh, we have people who just sit right next to us who uh, we don't want to disappoint. It's never good enough. I mean, even when the game ships, people are still saying, oh, I wish I could have done this, or I wish I could have done that. Most projects never ship. Most projects you even don't get uh, to keep your job after that. So being able to ship a game here for Naughty Dog was a huge honor for us. We all kind of solidified and sort of endured, and in a way that made the team and the philosophies and everything more solid than it's ever been as far as like what the proper way is to make a video game. You have an idea, you try to stick to it best you can, but you really have to trust the people around you to like help find it because on your own there's no way. You can't make this game on your own. You can't make any of the games at Naughty Dog on your own. When Andy and Jason started the studio, they created a culture of a group of people who really cared about what everybody else thought. Naughty Dog's secret has always been to hire the best people to work on the titles possible. And I know if, if something hasn't changed, that hasn't changed at Naughty Dog. Hire the absolute best people. When you know the developer uh, has a really strong ambition and a strong you know, uh, talent, uh, they demand the best out of everyone. And uh, you know, Jason and uh, you know, Andy always demanded the best you know, out of me, so I was able to learn a lot. We're just trying to push ourselves to get the most out of the hardware, to, to make the most beautiful art that um, anybody's ever seen, to make a, a game that is engaging and, and you know, people don't want to put down, um, to create worlds that people invest themselves in, just seeing like, all the, the fan art that, that comes out of the, the franchises that we create. And I think with Uncharted and Last of Us, you see the culmination of putting that talent together. And there's few other places on the planet that have that kind of talent sitting in a single office space that can work on a game to that level. On the flip side, teams are disappearing. People get tired. Irrational disappeared last year because Ken Levine, for whatever reason, decided he didn't want to continue Irrational. You can't replace Irrational. They made fantastic games, but there won't be another Irrational. If Sony wanted to make another blockbuster game, there's only so many teams. They can't create a team out of scratch to make it very easily. It just doesn't happen. So Naughty Dog is special. And we set out to make the Naughty Dog name mean something. And now people do say, that's a Naughty Dog game. I know it's gonna be quality because I know that team.